and uh, we'll invite uh, panel questions now. Please come up to the microphone and yes, kindly identify yourself. Before I begin, at my church, we are, our members are asked if they are being willing to submit to the government and discipline of the church as a prerequisite for being a believer. I say this because what I'm about to say and ask may on Sunday morning force my pastor who is here to submit me to that government and discipline. He will be conducting a memorial service later today. Inevitably, the family of the deceased will request that certain hymns and tunes be played. Indeed, the deceased may have specifically requested that certain tunes and hymns be played. If after going over the check which, which you show design discovers that such tunes or hymns are inappropriate to the teaching of the Lutheran faith, what should that person do? Uh, are you asking about a, a layperson such as yourself or about the pastor who is given the, the care of the family? We have had it in both cases. Okay. Uh, that's, a very, that's a very difficult thing and when a pastor is actually dealing with the situation is probably not the time when it's going to be resolved. Um, when a pastor has had an opportunity to be in place for a number of years, probably, at least for those who are members of his congregation, he will have had opportunity to instruct them um, through careful teaching and preaching. Uh, with funerals, what often happens is that the family is not associated with the congregation, may not even be Christian, may not live in the area. Uh, and so trying to provide pastoral care to that family while at the same time caring for the congregation can be very difficult. Um, I sort of have a reputation as being um, hard-nosed when it comes to hymns, although I think my members have found over the years that I do listen to them and I try to serve them lovingly. And I will usually up front say to the family, are there one or two hymns that would be especially important to you? If so, I'll try to incorporate them. And in most cases, I'm able to. Uh, some families are actually rather pushy. Um, they're disrespectful of the pastoral office. They view the funeral as a family affair and the pastor as a hireling. They don't, uh, they don't consider the actual faith and piety of the person who died necessarily. They may be quite certain they know that person's favorite hymns and maybe they're right. But if the family is not Lutheran, then they should not presume uh, to know what was important to their departed loved one who was. And it does require a certain pastoral firmness and confidence. Uh, now, if you have a good musician, as I have been richly blessed with, that makes a lot of difference. I, my heart goes out to brothers who have no musician or who have musicians who are poorly trained because uh, using music helpfully and appropriately is made considerably more difficult if you don't and in some respects it's impossible and I simply haven't had to bear that cross at Emmaus for a long time because I have an organist who can play anything and play it in such a way that the congregation will be able to sing it well. Um, I don't know if your pastor is blessed with such a musician, I, I just don't know. And we are? Okay. Um, pastoral care to the family is going to involve a certain amount of charity, gentleness, patience. But for the sake of the gospel, it won't permit a compromise of our confession. And uh, I think that's where judgment calls have to be made. And frankly, pastors use the best discernment they can. And, and they are able to sleep at night in the peace of the gospel knowing their own sins are forgiven. If your pastor makes a judgment call that in your opinion, is contrary to the word of God, then as a fellow Christian and as a member, you should go to him and talk about it. And I suspect that your pastor, being a man of God, would listen 
and, and then respond appropriately. Pastors are not infallible. They have to make decisions and proceed with them. And they don't always make what in retrospect they would say is the best decision. But they do proceed in love and in faith. And the faith of the gospel is our strength. If you are a, a layperson, as I said, and you're dis troubled by him, whether you're troubled by its heterodoxy or troubled by its orthodoxy, um, <laughs> the first thing you should do is talk to your pastor. And um, even if your, your pastor is caught off guard or, or feels uh, anxious about your coming to him, I guarantee you that a pastor will much more appreciate and be grateful for a member who comes to him with a concern rather than uh, venting it elsewhere, spouting about it, complaining to the neighbor, or just harboring anger in the heart. All of those things are sinful. And uh, they are as sinful as, as singing a hymn that isn't saying what it ought to say. And so we live together under the cross, and we're crucified by the law and raised by the gospel. And I don't know if that's helpful to you, but generally speaking, I'm not going to second guess another pastor. If he's faithful in his preaching, I'm going to trust that, that he will be aiming to be faithful in his choosing of hymns. My name is Eddie Kologi, and I'm a member here at Faith in Plano. And I have some comments and questions for Dr. Brown. First of all, I'd like to thank you for an exquisitely written book, one that I think will be a, a treasury of information and uh, stories for Lutherans from now till the Lord returns. It, and, and I thank you for the research that it took to do that. A couple of questions I'd like to ask if, uh, what, if, the, if the book itself had any, the preparation of the book itself had any bearing on whether you went to the seminary or not or, or vice versa, whether that had any impact, any, uh, anything there. And the second is, would you elaborate a little bit on the exorcism at Platten and tell us a little bit more about that? The first question about my work on the book and my attendance at the seminary. Oop, am I? Well, I had um, started the, the history degree um, that I was working on and then enrolled at the seminary in the, in the midst of it. Um, I had a, a draft of the dissertation done when I went to St. Louis <clears throat> in 1999, I guess. So I suppose the, the book, the, the work on it, and the decision to, to seek a, a theological degree from a, a se seminary of the church, we're, we're bound up together. I mentioned to some of you that um, I did not, in fact, grow up a Lutheran. I grew up in the, sort of the wastelands of American Protestantism elsewhere. Um, and came to Luther and to Lutheranism through th the study of Luther I mean, as a, an academic subject before it became a matter of, of confession and of faith. So the, the, the book, I would say, it was not the, the, the cause of that, but it was part of the, the fruit of that encounter with, with Luther, and I suppose an encounter that did begin for me as I was growing up uh, with hymns uh, more than through any other text or before any other text. I, I sang Luther's hymns before I had ever seen a, a small catechism or a book of Concord or uh, Freedom of a Christian. So that perhaps answers the first part of your question. The, the second part was a, about uh, one of the, the incidents in Joachimstaller, in the neighborhood of Joachimstall that I describe in the book, uh, an exorcism at, at Platon. And there was a, a, a young girl there Platon was one of the towns around Joachimsthal over which the, the clergy there had uh, oversight. Uh, a young girl there who uh, displayed symptoms which the, the, the clergy, after much consideration, un understood to be signs of a, a demonic possession, of a bodily possession of the girl. And uh, there were efforts for, uh, by the, the clergy uh, acting alone uh, through prayer and the application of, of the word to, uh, to minister to the girl and uh, to provide a relief from the, the possession. But what finally was effective was a sort of a communal exorcism through song. The girl was brought into the church and the, the whole congregation sang and uh, eventually as a result of that 
the, uh, the possession was relieved. Uh, she was no longer, you know, no longer controlled bodily by the, the devil that had afflicted her. So, you know, Lutherans today, um, I would say, say never, but, but uh, think about things in those terms much less. The, the bodily possession, not the, the spiritual possession by the devil, in which all the unbaptized, all the, the children of Adam are subject, but uh, bodily possession. What was, I guess what I was interested in in, in that case was the the way in which it showed and was told in, uh, by the 16th century Lutherans in such a way as to show that the power of the word of God as it was sung by the congregation, as it was the this word of God sung by the congregation which had the power, which as Dr. Suckwich mentioned, Luther often attributed to it, had the power to drive away the devil, right? Not simply in the, in a, the spiritual sense, you know, the, the afflictions of the, the devil against the individual conscience, but here, uh, very concretely and manifestly in the more unusual sense of a, a bodily possession. It was the, the word of God sung by the congregation that, that helped uh, this girl when, when other forms of application of the word of God did not. I suppose it comes back in, in a way to what Luther says in the, the small called articles and elsewhere that, that God gives the gospel uh, in more than one form. And, and it's not superfluous that God does so but um, God gives us all these ways of applying the word and the, through preaching, through the sacraments, and also here through, through singing um, so that we shouldn't neglect any of them. Does that uh, enlarge on that incident? It's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, I'm not sure how I would apply it in terms of modern pastoral care, but uh, it's one example. Uh, Pastor Chris Bramick, Holy Shepherd Lutheran Church, Hazlitt, Texas. Um, Dr. Brown, you had mentioned in your presentation about the, the spread of the Lutheran hymns, particularly among the children in the homes, and uh, it seemed to really be um, a, a force in Germany that, that helped to spread the Reformation. I'm curious then, why is it in later centuries Calvinism seemed to get so much more of a better foothold when they had no music, they, you know, their, their theology really wasn't spreading so readily through music, how is it that Calvinism get, came to get such a better foothold in Germany? Well, it's an interesting question. I think part of the answer to that is that the kind of foothold that, that Calvinism and, and Lutheranism achieved uh, really look quite different if you examine them closely. And I, some of the stories around the, the introduction of Calvinism into to Lutheran territories that I mentioned at the end of my presentation last night sort of exposed some of that. Well, that is to say, well, one of the main attractions of Calvinism for Lutheran princes and beyond issues of, of personal conviction was that Calvinism was much more useful for getting your subjects in line. Right? The, the emphasis on, on the law, the emphasis on uh, behavior and the, the, the external reformation of, of Christian life and Calvinism. If you're a prince who is worried about unruly subjects, Calvinism made a lot of political sense. And so in some place like like Brandenburg, where, um, where Gerhardt was, uh, was a pastor, the princes converted to, to Calvinism and then thought it would be an easy matter to turn their, their population over. Right? They presented it as, well, we're, we're not um, reversing Luther's Reformation, we're, we're simply taking the last steps to, to complete it and, and clean up a few things that, that Dr. Luther was, was too busy um, to, to, to finish taking care of. We'll get rid of the crucifixes and um, we'll um, take care of the last uh, papist remnants in, in the theology of the Lord's Supper and, and, and that sort of thing. But the problem that, people, that the princes found in Brandenburg and elsewhere was that the people were too wise in terms of the, the gospel to, to swallow that. Right? So what happened then for, for generations in, in Brandenburg was that you had the nobility and the electoral house who were Calvinist and then a population that, and pastors that were Lutheran. And the Prussian house, the house of Brandenburg, was one of the most powerful ones in, in Germany. I mean, eventually, by the 19th century, though those are the, the German Kaisers, they were unable to, in a sense, crack the, the nut of, of lay Lutheranism. They couldn't get rid of it um, and, until, uh, finally, at the beginning of the 19th century, the, the Prussian Union, um, which 
is such an important part of the, the background for, uh, for, for, for the 19th century emigrations of Lutherans from which the, the Missouri Synod comes. So Calvinism got a, a foothold certainly among the nobility, but one of the remarkable things about Lutheranism is how well it was able to hold on among the laity, even in the face of, of that opposition. I'm Mark Price, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Plan One Wiley. Thank you. I have two questions, actually, one for each of you, if that's all right. I, I had to. <laughs> okay. Um, the first is for Dr. Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, when I was reading your book, uh, my wife got it for me for Christmas last year. I, uh, I went from just moments of joy, and I was explaining this to you, to moments of just really sadness that our culture is so different than what they had. And maybe it's because you know you tend to idolize the past and things like that. But there does seem to be a, a family life there that we don't we don't have right now. So I was wondering if, just in your opinion, what would be the main cultural differences between Joachim's Tal in the 16th century and uh, Texas? I don't know how much you know about Texas. Uh, and, <laughs> In, in the uh, 21st century, and just the, these cultural differences, what do you think are the greatest cultural differences to overcome, if they need to be overcome, or that need to be uh, looked at before we can have anything near to what uh, happened uh, in Joachim's time? Well, uh, for, yes, first I said of all, yeehaw. <laughs> as a guest, for, as your guest from Massachusetts, I'm not going to presume to say anything particularly about about Texas. <laughs> not, not being a native of either place, I'm a, I'm a Kansan by by background and upbringing. But more seriously, I, I would say that I think one of the perhaps helpful things about the, the history of Joachim's Tall um, over the course of the 16th and the 17th century is the lesson for the church in applying the wisdom of what St. Paul says and knowing how to be abased and how to abound. Right? That is that our situation may not be that of Joachim's Tal during the, the period of flourishing when you know, the, 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 the town government was Lutheran and the, the services and the, the church were, were celebrated with, uh, with, with music and and all of the, the supports of, of art that, that people like Hermann brought to it. Right? I mean, that was a wonderful thing. But ge a few generations later, the Lutherans of the town were able to apply that, that heritage and, and those resources to survive under a very different circumstances. So d discerning what our present context is like uh, is a matter for for wisdom, right? it, it, it's not exactly the same as, as either of those situations in the past, but seeing that Lutherans in the past have applied and preserved the, the heritage of the gospel by means of song in those very different circumstances perhaps helps to inform our consideration and to, to shape our wisdom in, in making some of those decisions and, and discernment for our own situation. I mean, there are certainly plenty of of differences. I mean, we're in a sort of a middle land between, on the one hand, official support for the church and open persecution. Right? In a way, it might be more comfortable to be in one situation or the other. We're somewhere in the middle. How do we preserve the gospel in our circumstance? How do we make use of the heritage of music, the hymns, within our congregations and, and within our homes. And I think, in part, the, the story of Joachim's Tall, if it helps us to think about preserving the gospel under different situations and, and ones that we can't quite foresee yet, okay? and especially the importance of equipping people, whether out of immediate necessity or not, to, for, to preserve the gospel in their homes. That is, the importance of, of doing that is something that, that I would suggest for our consideration as, as an important thing to, to learn and to, to rejoice in the opportunities we have in our, our public life and, and worship, but also not to forget the importance of maintaining that in the home as well. 
Thank you very much. That actually leads me to my second question for Dr. Stuckwish. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's such a wonderful thing to see the unity that you uh, Hoosiers have with Texans. In the <laughs> <laughs> um, how, as a pastor with considerable more experience than I and uh, others, how what what Dr. Brown just suggested that the hymn come into the home and the family altar be set up when generally men are singing less and less and, uh, and, and even folk singing is more listening and not actually singing amongst themselves. Do you have any suggestions for how we could uh, promote this or, or teach this or encourage it? Well, yeah, I think it's an important thing. Uh, as I was listening to Dr. Brown's answer to your question, I would echo what he said, and, and even within our families, if we're, we're not scattered hither and yon, we're sort of separated from each other by our electronic devices. And, and, and I'm not opposed to computers and laptops and phones and things. These are blessings of God that can be used very helpfully. But they can also intrude themselves into actual human relationships. And we've become very passive, musically speaking, um, so that people aren't learning music, they're not learning to play, they're not learning to sing, they're not making music by and large so much as they're listening to it, uh, often in insular ways with things in their ears. I, I had my earphones coming on the plane and uh, at the airport waiting. I mean, I, I'm not sure there was a single person who didn't have a laptop or some kind of device, uh, you know, earplugs in the ear, listening to something. Um, so I think church is one of the few places where people still sing and, uh, and where music is made uh, in, a, in a folk sort of way. In other words, the people are making music. Uh, one of the blessings that I have with Deaconess Ryan is not only her abilities as an organist, but one of the ways she serves the church is by teaching some of the young people to play the organ, um, piano lessons, flute lessons, she has done a marvelous job with our children's choir. And uh, see, I think those young people are going to grow up as adults, both men and women, who do sing and who value music and cherish it. And I think that's one thing that can be done. I think um, I, I, I followed the lead of some of my own fathers in Christ in sending home every week. I call it daily catechesis on the way. Other pastors have different names for what they do but it provides them with scripture readings, prayers, a hymn of the week, um, special intercessions, a portion of the catechism. And I, and I lay it out as an order of prayer on the model of matins and vespers, but simplified for the home. And I know that a lot of my members, some of the older people for their own personal prayer and, and a lot of the families use this with their children and, and, and one another. And, um, you know, I, I can't force them and I wouldn't be inclined to, but I try to encourage and also facilitate uh, a family praying together, including singing, hearing the word of God. And uh, our congregational life, I think, helps to support that in the sense that uh, as a congregation, we're not only gathered on Sunday morning, but we're gathered for uh, daily prayer several days a week. We're gathered for festival services. So there's a rhythm to the life of our church family, our congregation, that does uh, help to serve and support and encourage the home life. But uh, honestly, you know, fathers need to spend more time with their children. I mean, I, if I were going to say one thing as far as the culture is concerned and as far as promoting things in the home, it, you know, fathers need to spend more time at home with their children and their wives. Um, and. Uh, Without that, it's going to be a hard, it, we're going to be hard pressed to, to make the impact that ought to be made. You mentioned just one other thing. Um, I, guess I talked in, in the 16th century context about the expectation that parents would teach the hymns to their children. Um, and that was certainly important. But another part, which uh, I perhaps didn't mention as much, is the expectation that often the children would teach hymns to their parents. You know, certainly, the, the boys in the Latin school would be expected to explain, you know, for example, if they'd sung in Latin, their parents, but also the, the vernacular hymns. And I think that that's of tremendous practical importance in that, you know, that the children don't know that they're not supposed to like hymns yet. 
right, the, the way that their parents are convinced. And I think in my own experience, that you teach, if you teach the children the hymns, the children will bring them back into the home. You know, you see, so if you can't convince the fathers to, to sing to their children, you may be able to convince the children to sing to their parents. Two final questions, uh, and that'll be it. We're going to extend it a little bit uh, longer here, a few more minutes. So um, go ahead, Leon. I want to thank you two doctors for coming from the other side of the Mississippi to uh, faith here in Plano. My question is for Dr. Stuckwish. Can you give us the source of the idea that during some songs, some of us have to be quiet. Last night we sang 12 verses of your song, very good. During six of those verses, someone was expected to be quiet. Mm -hmm. I had to be quiet for verse four, six, and 10. <laughs> you gave us some reasons, mm -hmm. one of them being that I should be quiet and listen. Can I sing and listen? Mm -hmm. Another one was that maybe someone wants to hear me sing. I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> In short, my question is, what is the source? Is it from scripture? Is it from tradition? Or is this some new tradition? And incidentally, I have special dispensation from more than one minister of music, usually sarcastically given. <laughs> you can sing if you want to. It's true. Thank you. Uh, you do live in the freedom of the gospel, and you can sing. Um, corporate, corporate life requires us to uh, humble ourselves and submit to one another that we would do the same thing together and, and not allow confusion to reign. Um, I appreciate, actually, your, your desire to sing, and it was not my goal to silence you or anyone. Uh, the source, if you will, there's not, um, there's not a particular verse of scripture that says to do this sort of thing, although it is clear from the structure of the Psalms and the instructions that are given uh, and, and descriptions of the Levitical priests who were the cantori uh, for Old Testament Israel, that the Psalms were often sung uh, responsibly. Uh, that's why the Psalms often have the kind of structure that they do. So there, there is a, a deeply rooted history of the church singing back and forth to itself, if you will. Um, my more immediate source is, is actually just what I have learned about the way that Lutherans sang hymns historically, especially in the 16th and 17th century. It was very common for the hymns to be much longer. And, and it wasn't simply to break up the hymns, although it's true, our voices get tired. And, and it, it, it is work to sing a long hymn if you're just trying to sing through it. But even aside from that, precisely because the hymns have the character that they do as uh, a means of teaching, and, uh, and um, so forth, that it is edifying for uh, the, the congregation to sing back and forth to each other, and for there to be times when we are hearing and not speaking, uh, and times when uh, we are s singing and our neighbor is listening. And uh, typically, this would be divided between a choir and the congregation, or different choirs. Uh, sometimes Lutherans would have the organist or other instrumentalist actually carry a stanza and the text would be in front of the people, but no one would be singing. Um, there are different ways of doing it, and it's simply a way of helping to engage the mind without wearying the body and also assisting the church in, in uh, serving the neighbor uh, collectively. Uh, Luther's Te Deum is actually written uh, in such a way that it's intended to be sung back and forth between different parts of the congregation. And, and this was simply the way that Lutherans did it. So one of the things I've tried to do to help my congregation not uh, sigh or, or recoil when they see a longer hymn is to take those longer hymns and divide them up in a way. And I try to consider the different stanzas so that I'll ask the men to sing certain stanzas, not just because it's convenient, but because 
there's something masculine about the text, especially if the father is speaking to the son or sending the son. And that when there are stanzas that speak of the church's joyful reception of, of Christ or heavenly bridegroom, that this is a, a time for the women to sing. And there are times when I love to have the children sing a stanza in which um, they are really preaching the faith and hope and joy of the gospel to their parents who may be beleaguered under all sorts of distractions and crosses, and yet the, the, the faith of the children rises up in the midst of the congregation. Um, I, those, those are the reasons. Uh, it isn't by mandate of God, but I have found it helpful in my congregation, um, and it is what our Lutheran forefathers did in their approach to hymnody. So. I want to thank both of you for excellent presentations. Um, being by nature fallen, sinful, um, manipulative, and conniving, I want to set you up a little bit before I ask my question. Um, our Lord in the book of Revelation has these uh, addresses he gives to the seven churches, the structure of which can basically be broken down into commendation, this is what you're doing right, condemnation, this is what you're doing wrong, correction, this is what you need to do to fix it. And so I would like, particularly in terms, Dr. Brown, of what you said last night about the intrusion of these foreign melodies with foreign theology. Um, I know that with our current hymnal, I believe that with previous ones, there, there's not only been a tolerance, but even a rejoicing in the very eclectic nature of the hymn selection. We got some from here and there and everywhere else. Um, so there's the setup. And I would like to ask you both to give us whatever you would like to, but invite you to do something a little bit dangerous. Take your historical observations and your theological observations and bring it up to speed in terms of as far as the next hymnal that gets produced. What have we done right? What have we done wrong? And what do we need to do to fix it? 30 seconds apiece should cover it. Thanks. <laughs> Well, I think that the example of the Lutheran response to the introduction of the Genevan Psalter you know, that I talked about last night uh, is instructive, or, or should be instructive in, in some ways for us in, in looking at uh, you know, some of the things that Dr. Stuckwich has talked about, about the, the associations that music brings with it, and not only um, the profane associations, um, in the case of, of, of some kinds of popular music, but the theological associations the, even that religious music brings with it. Right? Um, and that's a, uh, that's a serious question. It's one that requires wisdom as much as sort of a, a legislation or sort of drawing of, of hard and fast lines that uh, can never ever be broken. I, I would say in terms of our hymnals that um, there, there is sometimes the, the talk about having gotten hymns from here, there, and the other place can, can sound as though we were sort of making a theological salad. And I think that's probably unwise. Although we, we can, as Dr. Stockbridge said, sing hymns that are written by people who may have been heterodox themselves, but they, they've written a, a beautiful and, and orthodox hymn. I think one thing I, I do appreciate about that some of the recent hymnal work is the effort to bring together things from, from different cultural settings. So, for example, one of my favorite hymns in, in LSB is the, the uh, African Lutheran hymn, Listen to God is Calling. And it's not in a, sort of a, a Teutonic musical idiom or textual idiom, but it's a, a very Lutheran hymn. And it, it doesn't sound like something that a, a North American wrote, but it's a, 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 a Lutheran hymn that comes from a very different cultural context, and I appreciate having that joined together with um, all, all the other forms of, of Lutheran hymnody that I appreciate. So I, I think there's something to, the, the real, to showing the real Catholicity of the church uh, through 
the, the, the hymnody. Right? We certainly come from particular traditions that are things that are closer to most of the people in our pews, but also to be able to appreciate things that come from elsewhere, not appreciating false theology, but being, being able to appreciate the articulation of the gospel from different contexts. Um, I think in fairness, some, sometimes those kind of comments, uh, Pastor Heimbigner, come from people that do take a quota sort of approach. Where are you sitting? There you are. Um, and I don't agree with that either. I, I don't think tokenism is the best way to approach selection of hymns. But I think sometimes what has felt like rejoicing in this is really a response to the very tired accusation that we just sing these old German hymns and we use this German liturgy. And I think pastors have been at pains, usually patiently, sometimes not, to say that's, that's not what this is. This isn't simply our German heritage, but rather um, there are hymns from, from a German background, of course, because Luther and many of the early Lutherans were German, but we also have hymns that are sung by faithful Christians from all over the world. Not only Lutherans all over the world, but other faithful Christians. A lot of our hymn that he has roots that go uh, deep into the history of the church prior to the Reformation. And there are worthy hymns that have been written since the Reformation, even by those who are not, by their own confession, Lutherans. And yet, uh, the Holy Spirit has worked through the gospel and uh, in the midst of felicitous inconsistencies to, to faithfully confess what is true. Um, yeah, LSB could have been a better book from one standpoint. Uh, in terms of the context and the political realities, I praise God that it's as good as it is. Um, there are probably a hundred hymns, maybe more, in that book that I would not willingly choose to sing with my family or my congregation, and I don't. Um, I have been frustrated with some colleagues, uh, nobody in the room, but um, <laughs> pastors who have said to me, you know, if these hymns are in the book, I have to use them because my congregation insists. The commission on worship shouldn't have put them in there. To which I want to say, so you're telling me that you, with your divine call to serve your own congregation, can't say no, but you expect a man-made committee with appointment serving the entire Missouri Synod to say no, where you can't. That's unfair. It, it's just unfair. Um, it could have been a better book in lots of ways. There are hymns in there that shouldn't be in there. There are hymns in there that I wish weren't in there. All of the Psalms should have been in there. The Collects should have been in there. Um, I'm sorry that we lost the Anglican Psalms from the back of TLH, because I thought they served a nice purpose on occasion. Um, there's easily other hymns that could have been included, even aside from the work of translation that needs to be done. Um, so I think it could have been better in, in those ways. Um, but in the meantime, the way that we'll end up with a better hymnal in the future is by pastors exercising their authority for the sake of the gospel, not to lord it over the flock, but in love and care to um, lead their people into good hymnody, which is hard work. It's emotionally difficult. It requires patience. It requires a thick skin. It requires patience and love on the part of the pastor and on the part of the congregation. And um, I think it, it requires a certain amount of charity. Uh, this is what I would have liked to spend more time on uh, because there are hymns that are just not good hymns that many of my people grew up singing and they love them. And what is the right approach, pastorally speaking, to uh, lead them away from that which is not so good to that which is better. And uh, I don't think the right answer is in most cases to simply take the hymn away from them and never sing it again. Because I think with care, even weaker hymns can find a place. And so I've, I've been very deliberate about taking some of those hymns that are in the hymnal, but that are not strong examples, and finding places where I can use them uh, where they actually do make a connection to the readings of the day, and where in the context of other stronger hymns, they actually do contribute something. I, I, I make a deliberate effort to do that. But as I said before, I've also asked, especially the older people, to be patient with me and in love to allow the children of the congregation to learn uh, 
a, a Lutheran hymnody that will be their old favorites, so that instead of asking for Methodist hymns when they're in their 50s and 60s, they'll ask for Luther hymns and Gerhard hymns and Hermann hymns and Nikolai hymns. Um, and, and that's already, I, I think the older people, even if some of them probably would not want to admit it, they already see this. They see the children singing, not only with gusto, but with great joy. Hymns that they have in the past said are too hard or, or not helpful. And they see, well, these hymns can be sung. They can be sung well. And, and they bring joy and gladness through the gospel to the hearts of our children. And so uh, in the meantime, hymns that shouldn't be sung as a pastor, I, I don't allow them to be sung. I just don't choose them. And uh, when people have asked me about them, I've explained to them as patiently as I can why. And for the most part, um, the people have respected that. Um, and the main, Dr. I've, I've used this a lot. It's one of the smartest things anybody ever said. And I love it, so I repeat it. But I always give credit to Dr. John Kleinick because he's the one I heard it from. And he said at some point early in his ministry, he, he learned, I, th I think the hard way, that it's better to shine a light than cursing the darkness. And uh, he, he said that in response to somebody who had baited him with a volatile kind of question. And uh, <laughs> that, was, that was just a fact. Um, but the, the, best way to, the best way to teach people a love for good hymnody is to lead them into good hymnody and sing it. And when, when good hymnody is regularly used, the people will grow into it. And for people who are already you know, in their 60s, 70s, 80s, they may never grow to love it. It may never become their old favorite. But they can learn to, learn, they, they can learn to appreciate it, and they will learn from it. And they can serve their neighbor by uh, tolerating the introduction of those hymns. Just as some of my very enthusiastic young people uh, my Shiite Lutherans, as I call them, uh, can love and serve their neighbors by tolerating the fact that sometimes we sing hymns that their pastor wouldn't normally pick. So. Wow. Thank you. Thanks.